let's kick off with why we are specifically in San Diego. You're right. just kicking off your annual bus tour. You go yeah. and visit uh, uh, branches and, and meet lots of your employees. Yeah. What's the biggest thing you've learned yeah. from that process over the years? Yeah, so we do a bus trip. There's like a lot of trips. You meet people, clients, customers, employees, call centers. This one we do by bus, kind of off the beaten path. You know, not San Francisco and L.A., but Malibu, uh, San Diego, et cetera. And, uh, you know, because these are both clients and employees. We do a town hall later. We learn a tremendous amount. What we can do better as a company, you know, what folks would like to hear from us more about. And so, uh, and we have a lot of fun. We get to know the management teams better. On the bus in between, we take, you know, between some of these branches and stuff, we take tellers and branch managers and ask them, we give them beer and immunity and say, tell us what, tell us what we need to know so we can run a better company for our clients. And, and you've got a very warm welcome here, uh, which uh, I'm not sure how many chairmen uh, so far up the chain would get. Is that something that, that warms you? That, that you take a lot of uh, positivity from? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I love our people, and you know, this is our 10th. This is the 10th anniversary of Wamba, which is why we're doing this particular yeah. state, and then we're heading up to Seattle. And uh, yeah, you look, you know, basically a company is its people. You, they deliver to your employees, they want to do a good job, they want happy customers, and we talk about client obsession, we mean it, but that has to start with me too. I have to talk to clients. I have to have them, my lunches and dinners and town halls, and, and we have to listen to our people, because our people are the ones dealing with the customers every day. You mentioned the WAMU acquisition, 10 years since that, you wouldn't have the footprint you have here in California uh, if not for it. But you've also been a bit critical of some of those acquisitions you did yeah. during the crisis. 10 years ago, if you had the time again, would you do this acquisition yeah, again? Absolutely. You know, WAMU put us into California, where we really were in Florida, where we had a very small presence, Washington State. Uh, and we've gone from like 1,400 brands to 1,800. We've gone from, they didn't have small business lending here at all, or very small. We now have $7 billion loans up from something less than a billion. So it's, it's just a great, it's been a great thing for those states. In every community that where you know, WAMU was, we now have commercial banking, investment banking, private banking, uh, corporate social responsibility and philanthropy. So it's been great. The, the, the negative I always talked about was you know, we were punished a little bit after the fact by the government on some of the bad things that WAMU did. But you know what? That's in the past. But we're moving forward. You're one of the few big banks still actually expanding your branch footprint. And that's more in new geographies than just arbitrarily having more branches. What's allowing you to do that? Is it the regulatory environment that it now allows you to push into that? Or is it because you see weakness in some of your rivals in, in those geographies? It's the regulatory environment. They had made it clear they didn't want us to expand. I don't know why. I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. So we're opening, we've announced 400 branches uh, pretty much between Washington, Philly, Boston, a few others. And we go to those towns. We do small business lending, LMI lending, lower middle income housing lending. We do uh, you know, we do a lot of corporate responsibility, so it's really good for the towns. I remember we already do business in a lot of those towns in credit card, private banking, middle market, large corporate investment banking. So it doesn't add any incremental risk at all for us to open branches. So we eventually want to, you know, grow across the country and fill out some of the cities we're not in. Let's talk about the broader U.S. economy. We had a 4% uh, percent handle on the GDP print on, on Friday. Do you congratulate the, the president on that number? Was he right to take a sort of victory lap after it was announced? You know, presidents get a lot of credit, a lot of blame for things they didn't do, but the president has done things which accelerated growth. So competitive taxes, we needed competitive taxes. And the way the American public should think about it, for 20 years, we've been increasingly uncompetitive, driving capital and brains overseas. Regulatory reform, and I'm not talking about a big bank, I'm talking about small business. If you sat down and you do it one day with small businesses, they'll tell you about the crippling bureaucratic paperwork litigation that's, that we've had less small business formation in America than in any other recovery. So, yeah, that, this has accelerated the growth. We had 20% over 10 years. It should have been 40. The reason it wasn't 40 was because a lot of things that we did hurt ourselves. So I'm hoping we continue to have policies that accelerate growth. And growth is good for all Americans, That's, which is why it's so important to have some kind of growth agenda. Is 4% sustainable? I think we could do a lot better than two. And I, I firmly believe that the, the reason it was two was not some natural reason. It was bad infrastructure, bad taxation, excess regulation. We don't graduate kids at inner city schools, 50% don't graduate. We don't give kids the skills they need. We don't let felons have jobs again. We have an opioid crisis. I, you know, like take bureaucracy. It takes 12 years to get, to get permits to build a bridge that's already there and failing. And it took eight years to put a man on the moon. So the American public looks at this stuff and says, that's what's holding us back. It was us. So it certainly should be a hell of a lot better than 2%. And I don't know if the natural rate is 3.5 or 4 or 3, but it's not 2. Let's talk about the president's trade policies. Uh, we talk about the U.S. economy being strong, but China's GDP that just uh, came out was 6.7%. If that trade battle with China continues to escalate, 
who wins it ultimately? Who yeah, can so take it? Right now, I'd put in the skirmish category, and you know, and we the, we the business community is pretty much represented to the president that we agree with a lot of the issues raised by China. The business community in general would have approached it differently, which is to get Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Europe to have a common front to present to China the way trade should be done. It needs to be fixed. We want it to be fixed. He's taking an approach which, you know, I'm a little worried could create these negative outcomes. We've told the president that. I'm hoping his methods work. If it becomes more in the skirmish, if you do $200 billion more and you do uh, the auto tariffs and stuff like that, yeah, I think it could offset, you know, some of the benefit we've had from the good things he's done. You said you told the president that you yes. disagree with his tactics. Yes. What was his response? He obviously does agree with us. And so, uh, you know, but I would also does tell the, I, I was also, I was also tell the president that his, two of his advisors told him, and I'm not going to name them, but they told him there will be no retaliation. We said there absolutely will be, and they were wrong. He, they, several people said there would be no effect on consumer spending or inflation, and they're wrong. So the fact is, some of those things are wrong. I, I want him to do what he want, I want him to succeed at having better t uh, trade. I think NAFTA should be done. I mean, they, they've been talking about this for a long time now. It should be done by now. Mexico is a wonderful neighbor of ours, and we should move on, do a deal, do a deal with Canada, and then, you know, focus on China. Now, uh, clearly, as you've already said, you disagree with his tactics. But if we consider uh, the news that came out of his meeting with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker last week, that there is progress between the U.S. and the EU, does that suggest that in the long term, he may be proven right, that this could all work out for the best? It, it, it may. I mean, I, I don't know any better than you. Uh, and but you criticize his advisors for giving him the wrong advice on tactics? Well, no, I think that they, I think there's been retaliation. And I think if we do it, there'll be another predictable round of retaliation. And there'll be a mounting uncertainty and a reducing investment. And, it'll, you know, it'll eventually slow down the GDP. And, of course, no one wants that. There are better, we think there are just better ways to do it. But obviously, we want him to finish a trade deal with China that deals with the important subjects. You know, reciprocal ownership, uh, how intellectual property gets handled, non-tariff barriers and stuff like that. So those issues are all real. They need to be resolved. In terms of his team, uh, Jamie, were you ever offered a job in his team? And, and given that you, you question the advice he's getting, do, do you wish you'd taken it if you were offered it? I'm, I'm not going to talk about conversations. I'm, I'm very happy where I am. I love my company. I love my job. I know you do. Yeah. And uh, we will certainly be coming to that a bit more later. Just on the topic of the president uh, as well, very quickly, the president said in a press conference just now with the uh, Italian prime minister that it would be OK to have a government shutdown uh, that related to the, the fact that he wants to get funding for his, his border wall. What was your response to that? I, I think it's been tried before and it hasn't had good outcomes. And it hurts a lot of people who really have nothing to do with the process. So I think the political process should learn not to use those kind of things to get what they want. I understand the president's point, but, but this is, that is not a way to be productive and conducive to growth. Let's talk about the uh, Fed and, and interest rates, uh, Jamie, if we may. The president made clear in an interview with CNBC a couple of weeks ago that he preferred lower rates. Talking about the Fed's hikes, he said, quote, I'm not thrilled because we go up and every time you go up, they want to raise rates again. I'm not happy about it. But at the same time, I'm letting them do what they feel best. Did he go too far with that statement, commenting on Fed policy? Look, a Fed is given their mandate by Congress and that mandate is quite clear. You can argue whether it's the right mandate or not. I think the other thing that, that everyone should think in mind when they talk about interest rates is why are they going up? So if they're going up, and they're going up gently, if they're going up because the economy is strong, that net nets a very good thing. So it's very hard to look at interest rates and separate that as one factor and you know, say it doesn't relate to how the economy is doing. So I think as long as rates are going up and the economy is strong, we're going to be fine. When we look at the shape of the yield curve, a lot of people get concerned about the fact that it's flattening. Does that, to you, suggest that the Fed is going a little bit too fast, that they should take the foot off the hike uh, pace for now? No, I think it's, an, again, a very simplistic way to look at it. That's one factor. There are a lot of other factors involved. And well, in history, that happened before, but we have growth. I personally think the 10-year bond's going to be going up, not down. But again, like I said, for good reasons. You know, a natural rate for the 10-year bond today with inflation at 2% would be 4%. And so, you know, we've had a suppression of rates for you know, the better part of a decade around the world. Those things are reversing, but so far to good effect, which is, Global growth is going to be as strong as it's been in a long period of time, and America looks like it's accelerating. So as long as they're raising rates in that, that's fine. Um, when I think about your share price, Jamie, and for all of the big banks, it's been so tightly correlated with what the yield curve is doing. Uh, how do you think about that? Is that correlation overdone, uh, whether we get a slightly flatter, slightly steeper curve? Do you think people, the share price reaction to it is overdone? So we make a very clear disclosure. What do interest rates alone do to our P&L? Now, of course, that's not what the world is, right? Interest rates go up and down for a reason, but alone, rates going up, short rates going up helps our P&L, helps our profit line. So 
But I think there's an overreaction to that. I think banks are all different. You know, we're going to do quite well as a bank regardless. We don't take bets in interest rates. But if you think that rates are going down, the tenure, because the economy is weakening, obviously that's going to affect all banks. Yeah. I just think that's not, that's not what's happening out there. Yeah. So. Um, in terms of uh, the equity market, uh, Jamie, the, the, there's been some big tech earnings misses in the last couple of weeks. Facebook uh, was the high profile one. The Nasdaq is down sharply again today. When you see uh, those earnings uh, numbers and you see the market reaction, does that to you suggest the equity market, perhaps particularly the tech sector, is a little bit overheated right now? Not really. I think some of those things are very company specific. And obviously, companies that have very high PEs, when, you know, they, when your forecast, the future changes a little bit, it's going to dramatically change the stock price. But if you look at stocks, if you think we might have a good economy for a couple of years and their earnings are going to grow 5%, 10% or more, even if PEs come down because rates are going up, that's, that's a very likely outcome. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. I look at the possibilities and probabilities, but it, the economy looks quite strong. Consumers are in good shape. Their balance is in good shape. There are no potholes out there. Lending has been pristine. Capital expenditure is going up. More people are going back to work. Unemployment may hit a, a post-war low at one point this year. Those are all positives. And we don't have the leverage in the system we had in 07. You know, there's always going to be some kind of problem, but that, that is not the problem today.